What's up, man? Uh, once again, we're back with part two of what the hell happened to Ray Williams. Now, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody for shit, just taking interest in this and, and, you know, just listening to me tell my side of the story. Because what often happens when um, something like this happens and you're kind of good at what you do or did or whatever the case may be, a lot of other people, because, you know, that with, the, with the boom of social media and all that, a lot of people will write your story for you. And, you know, I never got the opportunity to tell my side of the story or what happened or just tell the damn truth. So I think we left off with me tearing my, um, my IT band while squatting at the field house, um, preparing, trying to prepare for nationals. So, um, had to sit that nationals out because on top of being hurt, um, I also caught COVID. Um, it was the first time I had had COVID because I missed two nationals back to back. And that's what really started the, the whole ball to rolling with Ray Williams retiring because it took me about, it took, it took a while to rehab the IT band, but I eventually got back to squatting big numbers. It's just that I was taking my boys home and I stopped at a gas station in uh, Sharon, Tennessee. And I just remember being around like it was a, 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 a Greyhound bus something. And it seemed like everybody on that damn bus had a runny nose or, and, and, and Lord knows, I don't know. Like, that's just where I think I caught it from. Because it just seemed like everybody that got off that bus when I was in that gas station that day, everybody was sick and had a runny nose. I don't know. That's probably not where I got it. But I know I got it when I dropped my boys off at home. Because other than that, we didn't go nowhere. We didn't do nothing. So I catch COVID. Bam. Miss Nationals. And then you go forward to the next year. I'm deadlifting. And I, that's when I actually messed up my adductor really, really bad to where I tore my groin. And yeah, but let's go back to where I was. But um, so catch COVID, have to miss the first nationals. And it sucked because I honestly felt like I was at a point where I could have been really, really competitive or wanted, but you know, it just, it wasn't in the cars. Um, and like I said, you saw in the video, um, I was squatting a good bit of weight. Uh, everything was progressing. It's just, I had one bad moment and there it go tore, you know, my IT band that, that whole setback. And if that never happened, ain't no telling what I would have been squatting by the time nationals would have rolled around. But, uh, yeah. So, now that we've closed, officially kind of just closed the, the part one, let's talk about part two. Part two is, um, you know, getting my doctorate while trying to power lift, uh, the birth of my baby girl, uh, all that kind of happened all around the same time. Uh, oh, also, I got married. Um, so, you know, life... Life really kicked into high gear around, like right after Sweden, life just kicked into a higher gear. And it's just like, you know, neurological overload. You know what I'm saying? You know how you got so much going on and you're trying to do everything at a high level, but it just don't happen that way. You know, some, some things suffer when you're trying to put max effort into so many places. Um, Cause a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think I got my doctorate from like, you know, online. Cause you know, you'll be talking to people like, yeah, man, what, uh, what, what services you get your doctorate through? Like service. But I went to the university of Memphis and I got my, I wanted to make sure. And this ain't no knock on nobody that gets their, Degree online, this ain't no knock on nobody because if you know me, you know I'm not about that. You know, kudos to you for furthering yourself and bettering yourself. I wanted to go to 
a brick and mortar school to get mine for the simple fact that if you like read comments or or you listen to some of the the rebuttals that people in the strength industry or or or, or, or athletes in general get when they quote unquote step out of their arena, people will be like, well, what does he know about politics and why are you talking about this? You're just a power lifter. You know, like, bro, that, that is the dumbest shit I, I, I see on a daily basis. Like, whenever, like, if a power lifter talks about something outside of the realm of a barbell, like, anything real life, then people will just flip this switch. Oh, man, you're a power lifter. You can't be smart. So, that's one of the reasons I wanted to make sure that nobody could say anything about the degree I have. Like, it took me six years to get my doctorate. It should have taken three. But because I was doing an ethnography, which meant I needed to be in a school to get my data, get my redo all my, my, my research, uh, get field notes and all that, COVID happened. So it sucks because you have to go through this thing called IRB when you're working for a doctor. So in doing so, in order for me to get into schools and do what I needed to do to get my, my research done, I not only had to do an IRB for the University of Memphis, I had to do an IRB for the city that I was actually gonna do my study in. I had to do an IRB for that city just to even set foot in one of their schools. and. That was just going to take forever. So halfway through, I'm talking, my doctor, my, my first doctor, I still got it saved on my computer, was done. Like the research was done. And me and my advisor, me and my chair, we sat down, we talked. And he was just like, we can wait. I don't know, you know, at the time, you know, it looked like COVID would never end. So, and we didn't know what COVID was or, or we could just start over. And I'm talking about my heart broke. My heart broke when he said start over. So, took those three chapters, pushed them to the side. I cried a little bit, <laughs> but then I got back to work. I, I reread some, some more articles. They gave me the ability to not totally scrap it, but make a pivot to where I could still use some of my 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 my, my articles and you know what I, I want. I can still I can still play around in the realm that I wanted to do with my original dissertation, but I just got to be smart and I gotta do everything electronically, phones and all, all emails and all that good stuff. So anyway. I say all that to say this, taking a doctorate, getting a doctorate, furthering your education, bro, if you're not one of those people that are just born with the ability to do numbers and scenarios and stuff in your head, bro, I had to work my ass off for my doctorate. I, I, I'm, I'm not smart. I am a hard worker. I had to work really hard to get this degree, which is why this is one of the crowning achievements of my life. Um, because you have no idea. Coming from Demopolis, Alabama, how many people tell you on a daily basis, bro, you ain't going to never be nothing. You're going to work in a factory. You you, you, you probably, uh, you'll be lucky if you get a job coaching at the high school or something. Like, you hear that shit on a daily basis. People telling you you ain't going to be nothing. So to get a doctorate and silence all that BS was, you know, one of the, the high points of my life. But back to the powerlifting. Um, powerlifting suffered when I was going to school. I'm not gonna lie, it did. It and it, it's amazing how once I wasn't staying up to one, two in the morning reading and uh, making corrections and edits and all that. How how much more energy I had to give to the sport, and it's how I just steadily got better to the point where I'm standing here before you now, and that's why this video is late because I'm training for NAPFs, which is in Scottsdale, Arizona, August 9th. Like, energy is not a finite resource. It's not, it's not. So I wanted to drop this weeks ago, 
But if sometimes you get in here, you get the training, and you look up, it's 11 o'clock. Like, right now, it's damn near midnight. And, like, I got to do it, so I'm going to go and knock it out. But, um, yeah, man, you're just tired. And it's not like I have a team of people here working for me. Like, I'm literally doing this with my phone in the posing room here at the gym just so I can finish what I started and let everybody know what the hell happened to Ray Williams. But anyway, um, so let's get back to the meat and tigers. That part of my life was very, very stressful. And it had nothing to do with school, nothing that. It was, number one, um, if you know me, you know I was a college coach at Mississippi Junior College for 12 years. Um, and it was some of the best times of my life, some of the worst times of my life. More, the closer it got toward the end, everything kind of, you know, and that, that's when the, the worst er times started to occur. Because, you know, the one thing you learn in life is if you have high demands, you should provide resources. And the one thing I learned being a college coach is sometimes those things don't always match or intersect. And what do I, what do I mean by that? The institution I worked for, a great place, full of great people. Um, some people I still talk to to this day. Um... You know, we, we, and you know, and shit, I'll never coach Mississippi football again, so I don't care. Um, we didn't have the fucking resources to do what we needed to do to win. And that shit is stressful. That is some stressful fucking shit. Um, if you've ever been in a situation where somebody is asking you to go conquer the world or be better than you were last year, and then on the same token, you don't get the resources you need to go do those things. And you're trying to manufacture success with nothing. Don't get me wrong. Eventually, eventually, that shit just runs out. Like that, that energy runs out. Because eventually, people start to see, hey man, this is, this is fake energy. This, this ain't real. You know? And if you are a college fan, if if you keep up with college sports, you see now schools building multi-million dollar facilities and new uniforms and NIL and all the stuff to attract the best players. Now, granted, in junior college, you don't get that shit. There's no NIL in JUCO. There's no money exchange of hands in JUCO. But the more attractive your institution or your program looks, which means facility upgrades, uniforms, all that shit that the old people don't give a damn about. These kids do. These kids care about the uniforms they wear. They care about the stadium they're going to play in. They care about the, the reputation or the tradition that a school has. And you put that on top of... Hell, you go to a school on a visit, and they've got turf and the jumbotron. They got their picture up there doing an intro that their family is gonna see every Thursday when they play. Hell yeah, kid, gonna wanna go there. And I'll give you an example. We had a visit at our school one time. I'll never forget this shit. And we had parents in the building. It was raining that day, and you know we're giving the facility tour. And right before you turn to go into the locker room, we had a leak in the ceiling, which we asked to get fixed, but the shit didn't get fixed. And we tried to get the shit fixed before, you know, recruits would be in the building. And shit, we got parents walking by a bucket that's just fucking just rainwater, just dropping, dripping on people. And you know, damn, this looks so bad. This looks so bad. And... It was another time, this was way back in the game, like when I first started, where we had a player's lounge where the kids could come kick it. We had a video game. And we, 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 like I said, we, as coaches, we did our best to make sure our kids were comfortable. You know, they, they enjoyed themselves. So we, out of, like, donated furniture, uh, our O-line coach at the time brought his old Xbox up there. We threw some games in. We created a player's lounge for our kids. 
the head coach went and bought a foosball table, all that shit, just for the kids to have a place to go to get away from campus. During the summer, it was all right. But during the winter, that room had no fucking heat. So it would be ice cold. So we got recruits back there kicking it. And we walk back there and it is fucking zero degrees. It is freezing in there. And I'm like, yeah, that. These kids ain't coming here. These motherfuckers sitting back here freezing. They ain't coming here. And you know, that's that's just. And like I said, loved it, loved my 12 years. But one thing you do see, if you ain't got resources, if you don't got what the people up the street who are actually winning games got. You know, shit, you ain't going to, you're not going to fucking compete this in this day and age. I don't give a damn what message you send. I don't care how many kids you graduate. I don't care how nice the dorms are. Kids don't get, football players don't give a damn about that. They want to win. They want to beat people on game day so that they can get the best huddle tape to send to these D1 schools so they can progress and move forward in their football. That's all these kids give a damn about. And being that our... We didn't get those resources that we needed to get the best players. Shit, we fucking didn't win games. So, shit, we came to a point where they was like, all right, y'all, we'll holler. And you got to think, leading up to that moment, shit, that was on our minds constantly. Like, damn, will we have jobs? What the fuck going to happen? So on and so forth. And it just got to a point where it happened one day. And, shit, it just, yeah. But, you know, but yeah, you know, that was probably the biggest stressor of them all because that's how I provided for my family. You know, that's how I took care of my family. And when I lost that, you know, like it was like, damn, what do I do now? You know, shit, the world just ended. So... Powerlifting during that and, and, and that I, I pretty much just skipped a whole bunch of stuff in the middle. But during that time when I was trying to rehab and come back, that on top of trying to graduate, having a, a, a newborn infant, trying to, you know, be there for my wife and bro, it was life was just <clears throat> stifling. And you know. We got through it because, you know, that's just what we built to do. But powerlifting, powerlifting was not, you know, and, and that's why people think I retired. You know, people think that Ray retired because, shit, I just wasn't on the same. I wasn't posting. I wasn't doing any of that. And, and here's the deal about, you know, and, and this is what people got to understand. People want to know, well, why weren't you posting? And, bro, don't nobody want to see Ray Williams squatting 500 fucking pounds rehab. Like, don't nobody want to watch that shit? And how do I know? Because when I did post during that time, that shit, like, nobody gave a damn. Nobody gave a damn. So what did I do? I just stopped fucking posting. I mean, come on now. Like, when I tore my adductor, I still remember the first deadlift I did coming back. I had fucking 385 on the bar. I'm not posting this. And this ain't got nothing to do with likes and shares and all that crap. This is me. Like, bro, I felt like, bro, this is, this is rough. Like, coming back from an end, bro, that sucks. Don't buy one see that shit. That's what I thought in my head, at least. And you know what I'm saying? So I, I didn't post. So everybody assumed that, well, you know, Sweden didn't go his way, so he retired. No, Sweden didn't go my way. It didn't. But the very next Raw Nationals that was in Chicago, I won my weight class. I was fine. The inaugural Sheffield, the very first Sheffield that was supposed to happen, they got canceled due to COVID. I was supposed to be there. So you have to understand, the whole retirement thing, it came from a combination of injuries and where the world was dealing with this, this global pandemic that just caused the world to shut down for a little while. You know, so that's where the retirement talk came from. You know, it was just an accumulation of injuries that stacked on top of each other and COVID. 
I never retire. I never officially stop powerlifting. It's just that, you know, I have a standard for myself and I'm not posting a 300 pound deadlift. I'm not posting a 628 squat. Like what, what, what is that? I'm not doing that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with that, but that's just me personally. I ain't doing it. And I did. And you know, People thought I retired, and then I came back, and you can clearly see that I was not healthy. I was hurt because, you know, we pretty much left Mississippi, jumped up here to Virginia, and, shit, I still was dealing with stuff from Mississippi, you know. But, um, yeah, because, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, man, you just got to you gotta take it as it comes. And for me at that time, shit, bro, it was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't duck the bad luck. <laughs> so that's sort of kind of where I'm going to leave that because there were a couple of questions that I got um, through DMs. And, and I'm not going to, because I wasn't given permission and I, and I didn't clarify this in the last video. If you got questions, just drop me an inbox and, you know, I'll, you know, answer the question on the next video. Um, which should be the last video. Um, but the first question was, uh, so why is it important for you to get a doctor degree? All right. So number one, um, my passion is high school football mentoring, being around younger kids, because I know where I came from. I know my background. I know how difficult it was for me. You know, like a lot of people don't know, I got bullied in high school. I got bullied, not high school. I got bullied all the way up to high school. And a lot of people don't know that about me. A lot of people don't know that. I got bullied damn near from the time I started school all the way up until like my eighth, ninth grade year. And the crazy part is, I can sit here right now and tell you every person that has ever bullied me in my life. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, and I know how tough it is for kids that come from those low socioeconomic situations. You know, I know how rough that is, you know, and the crazy thing is, you know, I think I have the ability from, especially being a college coach, I have the ability to talk to anybody. I can step into any room and I can be whoever I need to be for that situation. Um, but I got a doctor because my goal I want to be a head football coach at a high school one day. Um, I eventually want to be an assistant principal, learn the ropes, um, the, the administrative side, eventually be a principal and one day become a superintendent. That is my goal because I feel like God put me here to impact others, to, to, to help others. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, I hope that answered that question. That's why I got a doctor degree because I just felt like, you know, number one, Dr. Wade just sounds good. But second, um, I just wanted to make sure when I step into that arena that I've been around the people I need to be around that can help me be successful in impacting and helping others. And the next question, um, how do you feel the next, it was, how do you feel about these new young studs? Bro, I've been saying it for years. Powerlifting, the youth is where it's at. These, these, these young, this younger generation of powerlifters, these dudes are blessed. These dudes are moving mountains. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm blessed to say shit. I'm here to see it, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm also blessed to say shit. I'm, hopefully, I get back to the point where I can share the platform with some of these guys, you know, because, hell, I'm 37. And, you know, the one thing I do know about being a super, you can't stay this damn big forever. So everything has an expiration date. I want to have a couple of good hoorahs before I ride off into the sunset and one day become an IPF Hall of Famer. Uh -huh. And the last question, and 
what what was it what was it what was it I just can't remember uh, oh during during the during the the time where I kind of was injured COVID dealing with all that stuff what was the most difficult part about that the most difficult part about being on the sideline during that time was watching the sport just take the hell off. Just watching the sport grow and take off and you can't be a part of it. You can't participate. You can't, as, as I think it was Theodore Roosevelt, I can't be the man in the arena. I can't I can't be there to, to compete. I can't. That was the hardest thing in the world. Just having that ability to compete taken away from me. And just had to sit there, limp around, and just visualize. One day, I'm going to get back. I'm going to work until I get back there. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. That's all I had at the time. All I could do was just visualize until the day I could actually get back and do something about it. Um, and it was rough. It sucked. But this video was long enough. Um, I appreciate you guys, the people who, who who watch this, who listen. Like I said, my goal is to just tell people what happened, the real story. And, yeah, like, don't let nobody create your narrative. Create your own narrative. And that's what I'm doing. So, part three, hopefully we'll drop next week. But it's your boy Ray Williams. I appreciate y'all for listening. Holla.